you somehow realize something's going on and you don't know what. And then, then you want to inform your, the police or your authorities and you just realize something is off. So I hope not a word of it is true. But of course, if it is true, then uh, this is a catastrophe. And if this is substantiated, then um, I was misused by my own company for foreign interests. What an incredible spy story. And Switzerland is at the center of it. Imagine hundreds of honest people just trying to do their jobs. One of them ends up in an Iranian prison. Others spend their whole careers in the dark. I'm Susan Masika, and this is The Swiss Connection. say crypto, you might think of the currency. But I'm talking about Crypto AG, a Swiss company known for making spy equipment. My colleague, Veronica DeVore, has been following this story since it broke about a year ago. Veronica, I know that you love a good spy thriller. Is that why this story has stuck with you all these months? It's true. I just finished John Le Carré's last book and I couldn't put it down. So maybe that's part of what grabbed me about this. It has all the pieces, multiple spy agencies, secret documents, international intrigue. But mostly it's that it happened in our backyard, and I don't think I've ever heard of a story like this that's unfolded over so many years, where people who were right in the middle of it were in the dark for so long. And as you say, right in our backyard. Well, this whole thing is about a small company in the middle of Switzerland that makes highly specialized equipment. And there are hundreds of businesses like that all over the country, as you know, involved in precision engineering. It's one of the things the Swiss are known for, if you think about their watches, for example. And there are thousands of people working for these companies who show up to work every day just wanting to use the skills they've been trained for and do a good job. And one of those employees was a man named Hans Bühler. He was a salesman for this company called Crypto AG. He often traveled the world trying to sell crypto's product, a machine that could encode messages so only the people you wanted to could decode them. Okay, so Hans Bühler is a Swiss guy working for this crypto company, doing what sounds like a pretty ordinary sales job, selling some rather interesting sounding equipment. What happened to him? I'll let a former colleague of ours sum it up. This is James Nason, who worked at Swiss Radio International before it became Swiss Info. Hans Bühler was on his 25th sales trip to Iran in March 92 when he was suddenly arrested. And he spent nearly 10 months in an Iranian military jail being interrogated. And it seems from the records of the interrogations, the Iranians suspected that these machines they were buying, made in Switzerland, neutral technology, they obviously suspected that these machines were manipulated. This is a clip from an interview that James Nason did on the radio with Hans Bühler back in the 1990s. You're listening to the English program of Swiss Radio International. In this edition, James Nason looks into the mysterious case of Hans Bühler. Since his release from that Iranian jail, he's been spending all of his time trying to find out what happened. And a whole cupboard in the shack is filled with files of documents and press cuttings about his case. So did he think the Iranians suspected their secret messages were being read and arrested him to try and find out? I have no proof that this was the reason why I was arrested. Of course, during the interrogations, I was asked many, many questions um, about relationships that the company had. Uh, but all I knew was that we had customers uh, worldwide and the, the, the allegations which were made on these recent uh, television programs, of course, are, are terrible, terrible allegations. I hope not a word of it is true. But of course, if it is true, then um, this is a catastrophe. And if uh, this is substantiated, then um, I was misused by my own company for foreign interests. As a telecommunications engineer, do you think it's possible that those machines sold to Iran could have been spiked? Well, I hope not. I hope not. If they had been manipulated, then again, I must say, I have been used in the most disgraceful manner as a Swiss, na as a Swiss national from a neutral country, misused by a foreign power. Lots to unpack here. 
I'm stuck on these machines that Bühler was trying to sell to the Iranians. I'm picturing some kind of a device with letters, numbers, and dials. Yeah, that's pretty much right. Here's an archive video showing the machine in action. Okay, so I'm seeing a dial with letters on the left and four, five, six wheels with a combination of letters and numbers on the right. Exactly. So to use it, you dial the wheels to a special code, and then the encrypted message gets spelled out for you letter by letter on the wheel. It looks kind of like a bulky typewriter. I'm guessing these are a bit older than our laptops and tablets. Yes, so crypto mostly made these machines in the Cold War era and then sold them to lots of countries. Officially, they're called the CX-52 Cypher, or the Hagelin machine. So Bueller travels to Iran with one of these machines on a routine sales trip, suddenly gets thrown into jail and is later bailed out, comes back to Switzerland, and gets fired. And then he starts trying to figure out what's going on. I caught up with James Nason recently to hear more about what it was like to meet Hans Bühler. Here's James. I'm absolutely convinced that um, he was a very honorable man. He was telling the truth. And I must say, thank God he didn't know because the Iranians would have got that out of him. And the, the pressure he went under, I mean, one example was he said, um, you know, he was being interrogated one day and then the two interrogators said, OK, we're going for lunch now. And when we come back, we're going to put out your eyes. So can you imagine the pressure that Hans Bühler was under at that time? I mean, if he had known the real situation, I'm sure he would have cracked and the Iranians would have got it out of him. So I, I believe um, he, he, he absolutely had no idea that these machines were manipulated. So this was really a blow to him. He was really quite devastated at the time. Um, and he told me he'd, he'd been spending all of his time trying to find out you know, the real reason for his arrest and the real reason for his dismissal. And former colleagues of his from crypto were helping him assemble information, basically proving that these, these allegations were true, that the machines were manipulated. OK, so Bueller was saying these machines were rigged and claimed he had proof. That's a big deal. Was there an investigation? Was that the end of crypto? No, so Bueller took crypto to court over his termination, but ended up settling. And under the settlement agreement, he wasn't allowed to talk about the case or what he learned. And it was definitely not the end of crypto. Well, this is funny because I actually grew up in the canton of Zug, so in the same region where Crypto AG is located or was located. So I heard about this story because there were always rumors also when I was younger, right? I did find it interesting then, but it was always something like, yeah, there's this gossips around, it's possible, but I didn't really believe it's true, honestly. That's Fiona Endres, an investigative journalist who works at Swiss Public Television. One day in the spring of 2019, her team got a call from another investigative reporter working in Germany. He received a paper that uh, is something that would be maybe called the dream of a journalist <laughs> because he received a, a paper that proved something that so many people were working on for so many years and could never actually put their finger on it and prove it in that sense. So he received that proof. This is called this Minerva document. Das Dokument heißt Minerva. For decades after World War II, many governments around the world trusted one Swiss encryption company to protect their top secret communications. Now, a bombshell investigation has revealed that the company was in fact secretly owned by US and Western German intelligence, allowing agents from both countries to eavesdrop on their allies and enemies. While well, the Swiss government has called for an inquiry into the firm known as Crypto AG, so in February 2020, decades after Hans Bühler's arrest, the world learned that crypto's machines had not only been manipulated, but that the company was owned and controlled by the CIA. Yep, the CIA and German intelligence called Bayende. Wow, that is so sneaky. How did Hans Bühler react to that? I would have loved to have talked to him, but I missed my chance, unfortunately. He died in 2018. Oh no. So he went to his grave without the world knowing that his story was true. It seems like there was some pretty solid proof back in the 90s that this was bigger than Hans Bühler. Why didn't anyone really investigate then? 
So I talked to James about this, and he thinks the governments involved were probably pretty happy with the arrangement, and they wanted to keep it going. Everyone was benefiting. I mean, if what this Minerva report alleges is true, it was, a, it was an absolutely brilliant intelligence operation. It's been described as the intelligence coup of the century. Uh, absolutely stunning. And, you know, the, the, maybe the cost-benefit analysis, the benefits were more than the, you know, were judged to be more, more valuable than the costs. And I should add, it's not that no one investigated. Journalists tried. A book came out about Hans Bühler. There was a documentary about it on Swiss Public TV. The stories made some waves. But no one ever got to the core of it or figured out how deep it went. And the key was this Minerva report, which landed on Fiona's desk a few years ago. Here's Fiona. The source or the author of the paper is the CIA itself. It's historians of the CIA. It was in the archive of the CIA. It was kind of a summary of uh, all documents and protocols that were created during this long operation, almost 70 years. Wait, did did she say 70 years? Yeah, so this all started back in 1952, when Crypto Age's founder, a Swedish man named Boris Hagelin, decided to set up shop in Switzerland to make his cryptography machines. And he made a deal that he would consider American interests when manufacturing the devices so he could easily export them to the U.S. And later, he agreed to make airtight versions of the machines for some countries and versions that were easier to crack for others so countries like the U.S. could listen in. And when Hagelin stepped down from the company in 1970, the CIA and German intelligence bought it through middlemen. And all the proof of the CIA's involvement is in this Minerva document. Can we read it somewhere to get all the juicy details? Well, parts of it are public, so you can find a redacted version online. But as for the juicy details, besides the CIA, only this group of journalists that worked together to break the story from the Washington Post, Swiss Public TV, and German Public Broadcasting have access to those. Of course, they won't reveal their source. But they all worked together to verify the information in the Minerva document, or as much of it as they could. And Fiona told me that this process was sometimes really frustrating, sometimes funny, sometimes kind of sad, and it was definitely not black and white. Our big advantage was that in this document there's a lot of real names of people who were involved at the time, and uh, also in the more modern times, kind of. And... um, so we started contacting each name there and tried to find out uh, what was going on. And given the long tale of this story, the fact that it is one that that played out over decades, um, were some of the people deceased or unreachable? Um, I'm sure that was probably a complicating factor in all of this. That was very difficult and that made it very difficult to verify certain things that in the end we could also not verify That's also why we left some things open, because we could not say, is it correct what's written in the CIA paper, because the people have disease and and there's nothing around to uh, document it Mm. exactly. And additionally, and that made it for us journalists also interesting, was that um, even the ones who were still alive uh, often were old. And um, so... They forgot or claimed to have forgotten everything. Uh, I remember once I had a phone call with someone who um, heard already probably from somewhere, someone else, that we are researching about this. So I called this person and I said, can we talk? And he was like, no, 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 I forgot everything from the 90s before me even saying what it is about. <laughs> I think some people maybe talk liked to talk more because they could also finally tell a story that was maybe... Something that uh, was difficult for them also in, during their life, right? To keep it all secret. So um, that was definitely the case. But on the other hand, there were other people who um, really didn't want to participate in uh, our quest for the truth. Was there a real culture of secrecy around this? Is it somehow also cultural in Switzerland that people um, are quite private and, and keep these matters really um, to themselves? The funny thing is, I think because we are dealing with a world that is in secret service world, right? So it's like the need to know principle. So you only know what you have to know, exactly that. And um, this is a really important point. So during our investigation at one point, because we knew this paper by heart. So at one point we realized that we are the ones who know most about this. 
we realized that we knew much more sometimes than people who were actually involved because they only knew exactly that little part that they had to know to contribute to this whole operation, right? So um, I don't think that without this paper, there, there would have been one person who could have made this final link. Can you tell me a little bit about your take on the Hans Bühler story, how you fit that into the reporting or what type of a piece it was of this whole story for you? Part of this story that often gets forgotten. It was not only Hans Bühler, with him it was made public, but there were a lot of people, engineers, or also uh, other people working in this firm who really tried to do the best encryption devices in the world. High, highly secure. And and they always didn't manage and they realized something's wrong, but they never knew what exactly. And, and there were also other people who tried to inform the authorities about what's going on because they realized what was going on within their company and they tried and they were not taken serious. And this, this sounds now like, yeah, it's a small thing in this big operation that was really helpful for the security of the Western world, right? But if you put yourself into the shoes of this one person that must have been very frustrating. It's like they spent their whole career sometimes trying to solve an unsolvable problem, basically. Yeah, you have to imagine if you're actually, uh, if, if you studied um, such a technical field, mathematics, such a technical field, and then you have to believe that you can make the world more secure for neutral devices. And, and then you somehow realize something's going on and you don't know what. And then, then you want to inform your the police or your authorities and you just realize something is off. It, it doesn't work. And But nobody ever comes to you and tells you, hey, we have this operation and it's fine. This is uh, one of the gray areas because this story is not black and white, mm. right? You, you, you can always argue that this was a great operation also for Switzerland to participate. Uh, or you can say it's a scandal. There's both opinions. I think it's gray. And I think this human aspect of it, how, where's the limit? How far do you go in such operation? Do you put people in danger? So Fiona is saying that some people think Switzerland should be proud of having been involved in this. Does that mean that Switzerland was in cahoots with the spy agencies? So the Swiss intelligence authorities definitely were, or at least a small group of people within the intelligence service. An investigation by a parliamentary commission that just came out a few months ago showed that the Swiss spy agency knew about the operation as far back as 1993. And one of the parliamentarians who worked on the commission said that the operation was a service to the country because it helped Switzerland get some major intelligence, including about a hostage situation in Libya. But Switzerland is supposed to be neutral, isn't it? It is officially a neutral country, and there's a big debate about whether the crypto affair violated that neutrality. Some people think it clearly did, and others think it only did if people in the government knew, and right now there's no proof that they did. And Fiona says that this is just one of the big questions that still exist around this whole scandal. A lot of things stay unclear. Because uh, what, what we also saw now is that a lot of documents were actually destroyed. Um, other documents got lost. Um, so the commission, in the end, they could only find what was documented. But that doesn't mean it didn't happen, right? So they didn't find proof that uh, any member of the government, so the Bundesrat, uh, actually was informed about this. So... We just have to believe that now. And what we we have to take into consideration is that this operation took about 70 years. And the legal structures concerning secret services have changed so much uh, during this time. Uh, we have the new law for secret service in Switzerland, and, and that's very different and much more regulated than it was just 20 years ago. But for me, uh, the much more interesting thing, on, and I'm also a bit disappointed that this is not such a public debate as I would wish for, is, is the big question, Switzerland, what do we actually want? Do we want that something like this happen in Switzerland as Swiss citizens? Are we fine with this? Do we want to participate in something like this? Where are our personal limits as a country? And I think the great thing about the, the story about Crypto AG is that now something happened that never happens. In detail, such operation came out in the public. 
So this is a great opportunity to discuss questions about neutrality, about limits of secret service, and about what kind of secret service does Switzerland actually want. We are not in the Cold War anymore. And and the, the world changed, right? So so lines are now different. And, and Switzerland as a country, I think, has to find its position still. So it sounds like it's not the end of this story. Far from it. Actually, late last year, Fiona's team found out that another Swiss firm called Omnisec was also selling manipulated devices. So there are a lot more questions to be answered there. And the Swiss government has until this summer to respond to Parliament's report about crypto, which criticized the Secret Service for allegedly not telling the government what was going on. But maybe most importantly, Swiss justice authorities have hired a special prosecutor to investigate the breach of secrecy. What kind of a breach? So someone within the inner circles of Swiss government gave information about the spy operation to journalists, helping prove that it had happened and showing its scope. The information came from a special parliamentary investigation of the case that was supposed to have stayed secret. So if they want to find and punish the person who leaked that information, could that also mean trouble for the journalists who reported on it, like Fiona? They definitely could face pressure to reveal their source within the government. Just after the prosecutor's investigation was announced, here's what Fiona tweeted. Hijack a company for espionage purposes? Legal. Run an intelligence service within the intelligence service? Legal. Send unwitting employees into danger? Legal. Give information about it to journalists? Extraordinary prosecutor. Oh, so she's clearly not happy with the direction this is heading. No, we'll see what the prosecutor's investigation digs up and how far it goes. Well, thank you, Veronica. What a story that's still going on after all these decades. Absolutely. A Swiss spy thriller that, like a lot of things in real life, maybe raises more questions than it answers. We'll keep you posted if there are more big developments on this story. And if you want to look at the redacted Minerva report, or read more about the history of crypto age, or even see a photo of the Hagelin machine, that's all on our show page, swissinfo.ch slash eng slash swissconnection. Swiss Connection is produced by Swissinfo, which is the international branch of the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation. Our team is based in Bern, the capital of Switzerland. Have you been enjoying this podcast? Then please subscribe and tell your friends. And it'd be really cool if you'd give us a five-star review. The reporting for this episode on the crypto scandal was by Veronica DeVore. Our sound engineer is Danny Wheeler, whose booth is right across the street from the Swiss Parliament building. And Michele Andina composed the music that you're hearing now. Signing off for all of us, I'm Susan Masika. Thanks for listening to The Swiss Connection. Do you want to polish your knowledge about Swiss elections, referendums and political parties, while at the same time learning more about the quirks of the political system in Switzerland? If that's the case, our newsletter course is just what you need. Each week for a month, we'll send you a free instalment explaining the most important details of how Swiss democracy works. Our course teaches you who's eligible to vote in Switzerland, what the different parties stand for, how election and popular vote results are implemented, and what distinguishes Swiss democracy from other political systems. Our crash course is interactive, like democracy itself. Your questions will be answered on an FAQ page, and you can debate with other users and share your inputs and opinions. We will also provide links to multimedia articles and videos to help you better understand the Swiss democratic system. Please join us and sign up for the free Democracy Crash Course newsletter 
at www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy. That's www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy.